So, Christmas, what's this? What's this? What's this? So, a lot of people are just shouting Christmas. It's Christmas crackers. What's this? Yeah, it's Christmas as well. Um, so, in my family, when I was growing up, um, I used to be 10. It's strange to believe, I know. But around that age, the, the two things I'm most associated with Christmas in our family Quality Street which in those days came in much bigger tins, um, and also Harvey's Bristol Cream, which is it's not particularly a good sherry, but it's just the taste of Christmas. Um, and some of you probably will associate other things with Christmas. But, yeah, that definitely splits the, the room, doesn't it? Those who love them and those who don't. But even if you don't like Brussels sprouts, mostly you think about these... Um, Let's call them what they are. These are great things. I love them. I love the decorations. Uh, I love them. I'm very fond of the presents, particularly. Maybe even more fond of the dinner. So I'm, I'm a, a big fan of Christmas. It, it actually really is my favourite time of year. Uh, and what I want to do is just look at why we get so much celebration at Christmas. Why do we do it? Why is it that all across the world, really, um, it, it's this big deal? Um, why? Why Christmas more than any other time? And uh, I want to look at that starting with one of my other favourite things, which is the universe. I'm very fond of the universe. Uh, it's been much on my mind this week because of the new Star Wars film as well. And I want to just start with the universe and work my way down, hopefully, to, to get a, a, an insight into what Christmas is like. And uh, the way I want to do that is by thinking about... Uh, this, lift up your eyes, uh, Isaiah says, lift up your eyes and look to the heavens, who created all these, all the stars, he who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name. Now, here's a way that I like to think about this, it, it may help some of you, it may not, but uh, one of the first things I do every morning is I, I put in my contact lenses. And without them, I can't see. So a contact lens, you can see in the picture here, if you've not seen one before, it's a small sort of hollow dome of plastics, about a centimetre across, very small. And what you do is you just sit it on the end of your fingertip, you put the lens in there, and I, I drop in one drop of solution, and then I just pop it in my eye, and then I can see all day. Uh, and it works when I'm swimming as well, so it's much better than glasses. So that's the contact lens. And I just like to think sometimes, I like to imagine uh, a way of grasping how great God is. Just imagining the universe in God's contact lens. Now, I'm not suggesting that God wears contact lenses. I'm not <laughs> suggesting he's so short-sighted he needs a lens the size of the universe. But just as a way of thinking about the greatness of God, I like to imagine just like that one drop of water that I have in my contact lens containing the whole universe. And that's the greatness of the Creator. So, let's try and get a, a little bit of a grip on how big that universe is. And we'll just zoom down. So here is, I don't know how they drew this, uh, but apparently this is the observable universe. And uh, all these next set of pictures I'm going to show you are taken from this website, You Are Here. And you don't need to follow them in detail. You can just get a feeling for what they're saying, for the sort of shape uh, of what they're showing you. So the observable universe, uh, astronomers look at it as being broken up into what they call superclusters, and that is clusters of clusters of galaxies. So if we zoom in on some of these superclusters, the, one of them is called the Virgo supercluster, and that's the one where we live. And when you zoom in inside it, you see it's made up of many clusters of galaxies. And you look inside that, you get what's called the local galactic group. So uh, here's us, here in the middle. The Andromeda galaxy here is the, the only other one you can see with the naked eye, if the conditions are right, and lots of other little galaxies in the area. But within this group, if you zoom in, you can just see here's the local group, us and our nearest neighbours. This is our galactic realm, just our galaxy, a uh, couple of uh, clouds of stars nearby. So this is a tiny, tiny, tiny part of the whole universe. But let's zoom in a bit further. This is our galaxy. Within here you've got 
the solar interstellar neighbourhood. What that means is just what's nearby, the stars that are nearby. So you can maybe see in the middle of the red words, even if you can't read what they are, that's us. And nearby you've got uh, other stars whose names you might recognise, Sirius, Arcturus, Vega, some others. And let's zoom in on here. Uh, this is the Sun's neighbourhood, just the closest stars. Maybe you can make out Alpha Centauri near the middle there. The closest star to us. By the way, what does close mean for the closest star? Anyone know how far away it is? 41,500 miles away. It's a lot further than that. Someone else, I think, said four light years is correct. What that means is if somebody uh, on a planet orbiting the nearest star turned on a torch and we were looking directly at them, it's so far away that it would take four years for the light to reach us. We wouldn't see it for four years. And that's the nearest star in this galaxy, which is part of one cluster, which is part of one supercluster. So I hope we're starting to get some sense of the size of the universe. All of this will be relevant. Let's zoom in a bit closer. Here's the solar system. There's the sun. There are eight planets. Um, Probably most of you have heard Pluto's not a planet anymore. It got relegated. Yeah, a lot of people are sad about that. But yeah, astronomers say that's the way it is. So there it is. Uh, and then zooming in here, the solar system in a little more detail. And of course, here's where we are. This is the Earth. Let's zoom in a bit closer. Who can tell me which part of the Earth this is? Yeah, it's the Middle East. <clears throat> and then particularly... Up here, this bit, we'll zoom in a bit closer. What are we looking at? Israel. Here's the Dead Sea. The other little body of water up there, that's the Lake of Galilee. Out here, this is the Mediterranean. All of this area is Israel. And we're going to zoom in on this bit now. We can see Jerusalem. And just south of there, where the, the red marker is, this is Bethlehem, as it looks today. Very grown up, of course, now. It's a, it's a big, sprawling city. Very unappealing. Let's just zoom in a bit closer. So maybe it's how it looked 2,000 years ago. Much smaller, little cluster of buildings. There's a star above it. Zoom in a little closer. A stable. Inside the stable... a mother and a child and in fact ultimately it's about the child isn't it Jesus born in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago now here is what I find just astonishing so hard to grasp but so moving when I do this child a baby uh, an incompetent baby that couldn't speak or eat or feed itself is the one that made this universe. That baby is the great God who is so great that the whole universe fits in that little contact lens on the end of his finger. So when I think about Christmas, although I do think about Christmas trees and presents and especially about Turkey, I also think about this ridiculous, this amazing kind of compression of the great, great God who is above and beyond and outside everything that we see, all the galactic superclusters and everything else, crushing himself down, compressing himself down, 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 down into a baby. It's a, an amazing thing to claim. And by the way, if anybody ever tells you that all religions are the same, this is one reason why that's not true. You know, it's one thing to have a religion that says, be nice to people. Uh, and I am in favour of that. But the claim that Christianity makes is so much greater, so much more preposterous, that if it's true, and obviously we say it is true, it's the most important thing there is to see and to know and to understand. This baby, containing a whole universe and so much more than a whole universe... So that's why 
we have all the things that we think about in the Christmas story. <clears throat> um, it's been great having the readings, by the way, coming through the rest of this service and, and sort of talking about all the things I wanted to point to here. We had the shepherds in the fields. Uh, am I still coming through okay, by the way, in the microphone? Yeah, yeah good. Shepherds in the fields and this angel appearing to them. And by the way, I quite like this bit of artwork because the angel's too bright to even see. And I, whenever you try to draw an angel or paint an angel, I think it's always inadequate. But here, at least, there's a sense of something incredible. And why? Why is an angel turning up in the middle of a, a deserted, cold field in the middle of the night uh, by a, an unregarded little town? Well, it's for this reason. Uh, Peter says in one of his letters, even the angels long to look into these things. You know, the angels caught some glimpse of what was going on, of this almighty God, their creator, the creator of the universe, compressed down into a baby. Can you imagine how confused the angels were by that? How could they make sense of something like that happening? No wonder they wanted to be there. Or if you think about the wise men that uh, traveled in from the east, somehow had figured out, somehow understood from God that this child was going to be born, made that journey, brought those gifts. Why? Because of this incredible child who's not just an adorable baby, but who contains the whole of the God who made it all. Or you can think about um, the prophetess, Anna, in the temple. Um, she comes in slightly later in the story of Jesus. Uh, she's, it's not completely clear how old she is, but it's clear that she was very, very old. Um, and she'd just been searching the scriptures all her life and wanting to see the promised one. Now, she probably didn't understand, at least at first, exactly what Jesus was. You know, the Jews were waiting for the word is Christ. That's where we get the word Christ. Or Messiah is the same word. It just means an anointed one, or somebody who has God's power. So she was probably waiting for somebody like maybe King David, you know, a great king of Israel. Um, but actually, what came was so much greater than that, wasn't it? The Christ, when he came, was God himself in human form. So what an amazing thing for Anna to finally meet him before she died. And uh, again, that same passage from Peter's first letter that I quoted earlier makes a point about all of the prophets, really. Um, not just Anna, but all through the Old Testament. Concerning this salvation, the salvation that Jesus brought, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care because they just got glimpses, you see. They just saw little bits of what God was doing and they wanted to find out more. Or uh, here's another one. This is, um, is it Simeon? I forget the name now. Yeah. Um, he is somebody else who the young Jesus was presented to at the temple. And he comes out with this famous prayer that says, Lord, now dismiss your servants in peace because my eyes have seen your salvation. Now he realized when he saw Jesus that what he'd been waiting for his whole life had come. And he was ready to die. That's how much it meant to him. Why? Not because of a cute little child. Not just for that reason, at least. But because of God himself in human form. So that's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with the God who made all of it. Everything far, far beyond what we can see or understand or grapple with in our minds. That God in human form. In the form, first of all, of a baby... Uh, and then, of course, he grew to be a man. And we know that as a man as well, he was subject to the same limitations that we are. Uh, this is Jesus meeting the woman at the well. Why was he at the well? Very simple reason. Because he was thirsty. Now, how does it even make sense for the God who made it all to be subject to something as mundane as thirst and need water? And yet, that's what happened. This is what the Bible tells us. That Jesus was made human. He was made flesh. He was made one of us. And ultimately, of course, uh, when he was crucified, he went through really the worst thing that happens to every mortal, which is death. 
even to die, for God himself to die, is the most astonishing thing. And of course, the seeds of that death were there when he was born, because everybody who was born dies. Why would the almighty God, who has all power, who knows everything, who sees everything, who can do anything, why would that God allow himself to die, to go through death? Well, there's only one reason, isn't there? It's because he loves us. It's as simple as that. It's because he loves us. So Christmas is a celebration not just of a baby being born, not just of eating Quality Street and drinking Harvey's Bristol Cream, but also a celebration of the God who loved us enough to be born and to die as a human. And this is what Martin Luther said about the, the baby Jesus. If you would have joy, bend yourself down to this place. There you will find that boy given for you, who is your creator, lying in a manger. I will stay with that boy as he sucks and is washed and dies. There is no joy but in this boy. And I know of no God but this one in the manger. So as we rightly over the next week or so enjoy all these other things, and I will enjoy all these other things, we want to remember as well that it's God himself in that baby. And this is why uh, maybe my favorite Christmas carol, which we will sing in a moment, is this one, O Little Town of Bethlehem, because I love how it captures the sense of, of the greatness of the universe. You know, that above their deep and dreamless sleep, the silent stars go by. They don't understand. The rest of the universe is out there, all those galactic superclusters, and yet what really matters is happening in this tiny place, in this little stable, in this little town, in this little country, on this little planet. The thing that really matters, the birth of God himself. In your dark streets shines the everlasting light. And every hope that ever meant anything, and every fear that's ever meant anything, all through the years, all of those things come together here in this one place when Jesus is born. So I would like to sing that hymn now. We'll finish this morning's service singing O Little Town of Bethlehem and recognizing that incredible God. <laughs>